Hello everybody. My name is Fee Mercer. I'm the CEO and the founder of the Governance Evaluator and a very big welcome to everybody to our Governance Data Insights 2020 webinar. Today I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by some other really fantastic people who are from organisations that we have the privilege of partnering with. And I'd just like to introduce you to our expert guest panel today. So first of all, we have Joanne Wolfert. Joanne is the Director of Projects and Consulting at the Victorian Healthcare Association, and is also the Executive Director of the Australian Centre for Healthcare Governance. So a really big welcome to you today, Joanne. We also have Brendan Moore, who is the Director of Member Services at our other partner, Leading Age Services Australia, and is also a convener with the Governance Evaluator with us. So too is Joanne. We also have Tracy Kane, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Australian Public Affairs, and is also a Governance Evaluator convener with us. And a big welcome to you, Tracy, as well. And a big welcome to Leon Cox, who's the General Manager of Membership and the State Manager of Victoria of the Governance Institute of Australia. A big welcome to you as well. And I really look forward to discussing with you all today as we go through the five top risks in governance that have been identified in our governance data insights in 2020. So top risks in 2020 that we have identified are around stakeholder engagement, strategic direction, continuous review and development, risk management, compliance, and sector relevant skills. And to bring those risks to life and to talk about them and hear some insights and tips, we just thought it'd be fantastic to go through all of those with our panel members today and have those discussions with you. So first of all, I'd love to start with you, Tracy, and I'd love to get some insights from you about what have you noticed in the independent school sector about key stakeholder engagement? Well, I think the first thing is this year has obviously made a, a remarkable difference in terms of how and the necessity around stakeholder engagement. So I'm not surprised it's come up as the number one concern for board members. Where schools are concerned, and particularly independent schools, I guess there is an assumption that because you have your significant stakeholders on site every single day, that's a form of engagement. And you know them because they're there, you're constantly talking to them. And what I think needs to be stressed is that's actually not stakeholder engagement. That's politeness, that's common courtesy, but it doesn't give you an insight into how your stakeholders are thinking about things, what's on the horizon, what are their priorities, what are they willing to give up for something else, what would it take to shift their views on the direction of the, the school or the organisation or a significant program, for instance. So I think one of the lessons for schools out of this year is that having them on site is not enough, you actually need that formal process. And of course, it became very, very stark for a number of schools when, of course, there was lockdown and no one's allowed on site. And all of a sudden, I have no way of testing. I have no way of knowing what people are thinking. I think that's really true. That's really interesting. And for you, Brendan, of course, your focus is aged care. What have you seen in relation to key stakeholder engagement in aged care and why it would be a top risk there? Yeah, so just building on a little bit of what Tracy just said, what we've experienced in aged care is a, a number of years of change where we've gone from having the, if you like, the government as the primary stakeholder, as the purchaser of the services from our industry, and a, a lot of regulatory changes driven the industry away from seeing the government as the primary stakeholder and therefore seeing the consumer, to Tracy's point, the consumer as your primary stakeholder, but it's not enough, as she says, just to expect that because they 
they are there every day that that is uh, stakeholder engagement. Yeah. I think we're, we're seeing a real um, shift that's uh, partly driven by regulatory reform to put the consumer at the centre. And boards are, if you like, grappling with that change. It, it's sort of been a slow creeping change over probably three years, but it's really now one year into a new set of quality standards that we're seeing some real separation and change in terms of how organisations are performing. And the other real big change that I think our industry has had to experience as a result to stakeholders is media. So aged care has not been an issue that the media has taken a great interest in up until about two and a half years ago. And since then, it has been, I think most of my colleagues from the industry would describe it as being fairly relentless since then, with seemingly every day a new crisis story from aged care. And and so boards have had that uh, challenge around how do you productively engage with media when really they're just looking for the crisis story and the narrative to paint you as the bad guys. So that's, I suppose, the two really big shifts that I'm seeing from a director's perspective around stakeholder engagement and why it might be the top risk in aged care. That's incredible. And Joanne, from a health sector perspective, what have you been noticing around key stakeholder engagement? Look, I think the health sector's worked really hard on engaging with their consumers and the families over the last couple of years. And I think health's built some really solid systems to interact regularly with the clients, patients and families that use their services to make sure that they're talking to them about the services that they provide, getting feedback on how they feel about the services that they're receiving. Most health services have really well-established community advisory committees and, and they speak to those consumers on a regular basis. What I think is the missing piece in the health sector is looking beyond your consumers as key stakeholders. They're definitely the the largest stakeholder group, but there are many other stakeholders that particularly the board needs to engage with and to develop relationships with. And I'm thinking particularly of government, for example, the local council, other agencies in the area, particularly if it's a rural sector health service, they need to have good, solid relationships with other community and health providers in their particular region to look at how they can establish partnerships and think more broadly. And I think that's often the piece that boards and some of the executives in health services don't necessarily pay the attention to in the way they do to the consumer groups. So particularly from a board perspective, I think that's where they need to be looking in terms of enhancing their stakeholder engagement. Mm, That's interesting. That's a good perspective. And Leon, what about the Governance Institute of Australia's perspective of stakeholder engagement to to give us that broader view, not just from our different sectors? Thanks, Fee. And I'll offer uh, a couple of um, perspectives in this piece and, and most likely throughout the remainder of the webinar. Firstly, from a broader business and and economy perspective, we're seeing quite an interesting shift in terms of stakeholder engagement and how organisations are able to do that on the back of the um, pandemic. And in particular, one example is the rise of the virtual AGM and the fact that that virtual AGM has provided a new way of access for a variety of people, primarily for, for shareholders, but stakeholders as well, who are able to observe those AGMs and really get a a deeper sense of what an entity is up to, what they're planning and how their performance has been over the the prior period. I think that's uh, also quite interesting to watch because leading up to this point, attendance at AGMs was actually declining. Uh, And so organisations were struggling to get a really good read on what both the stakeholders and shareholders were looking for from their organisation that they're involved with or that they had expectations of. So I I see that as a a really big upside in terms of how businesses are able to engage and getting much more information and, and more data 
whether it's a good thing or not for the chair and some of the curly questions that come through to the chair during the meeting. I suppose that's dependent on the meeting itself. <laughs> and from a, an association standpoint, talking a little bit around what Governance Institute has been up to this year, it's created an opportunity to hold regular virtual town hall meetings. And so that gives us opportunity to engage with our members and constituents uh, on a more regular basis and gives our members direct access to the likes of our president and CEO. So whilst it's been different, I would say there are, there are some real positives coming through from 2020. Leon, thank you. And look, it's really interesting because one of our guests has actually asked about the notion of stakeholders actually sitting on the board uh, as a way of making sure they're engaged. And this is actually causing confusion. Do any of you, just before we go on to the next list to discuss, have a view on that or have any any thoughts? I see everybody nodding. Joanne, you were nodding what, and Tracy as well. Just jump in, guys, and tell us what you think because I think that's a great question. Look, it's, it's a really interesting challenge because... Mm role of a board director is to govern the organisation. It's not necessarily to represent a particular stakeholder group or community group. And uh, a board director should be there to contribute skills that are going to deliver on the strategic plan and add value to the governance of the organisation. Having said that, if they are totally divorced from the stakeholders that the organisation is there to serve... Yes that then causes a real challenge as well. So I think it's finding a, a balance to make sure you've got the right group of skills around the table. And particularly if you're in a rural health service, we find that there's often a lot of tension about bringing people from outside of the area onto the board because they're not seen as being part of that stakeholder community. But it's the skills-based board that's really important. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later on, so I won't go into it too much. But the, the bottom line is a director is there to govern the organisation, not to represent a stakeholder group. Very good. Tracy, you were going to comment as well. Really, really echoing what's just been mm. said. That unless you have a representative model, everybody must park that at the door. And I think there is a, there is a danger in assuming one person from a community speaks on behalf of that community and increasingly... There, there's no there's no consistency between a stakeholder group just because you happen to be a parent at a school or a student at a school it doesn't mean that the kindergarten one thinks the same as the year 12 one and I think there is a there is a real danger of the idea of we'll have one stakeholder on our board and therefore we represent all views it just doesn't work that way no I think that's really wise I think that's great feedback thank you and also a great question so let's move on to the next area where the data highlighted is, is a risk across all sectors. And this is about strategic direction. And Brendan, I want to start with you. When I think about all your experience and work in aged care through LASER, through all of your convening and consulting, talk to me about strategy in aged care and what are some of the issues you've identified? Well, I think strategy is hard in aged care at the moment <laughs> It is a very uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, to quote the VUCA acronym, a time <laughs> here at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of uh, regulatory uncertainty with the Royal Commission hanging uh, around, uh, yet to deliver its findings and obviously yet to have a government response to that. So it is very difficult to set strategy in the absence of clear signalling from government when you are effectively uh, an outsourced service delivery arm of government policy. Not entirely, it must be said. So there is scope for boards to set strategic direction. And so I suppose a point I would make here is that this is an area that we are starting to see divergence emerge. We are starting to see the organisations with good boards that are setting strategic direction, that are, shall we say, controlling their destiny in some respects. They're separating themselves as high performing organisations. They do have a really clear sense of their strategy and purpose around the future. And that's a, a point I think we'll see more and more divergence. Without a strategy, you effectively have no plan to go anywhere. Uh, and that's quite self determining. 
The other um, point around strategy at the moment is just how challenging it has been for 2020. I think we've got to the second question before I mentioned COVID. And so it's been a difficult year all round for boards. And so with COVID around and a number of other factors, there's been a lot more dropping down into the operational matters and the expression of getting sucked into the weeds. And, and so sometimes that can be comfortable for boards and they don't mind going there, so they're happy to stay there, but that's not where boards should be operating. They should be very much focused on creating value for that company for the future. So that's just a, a quick snapshot from the aged care side of things. Thanks, Brendan. That's really good. And, and Joanne, for you, with all of your work, through VHA across the health sector, working with all the boards. What are you finding this year around strategy, which makes it a bit of a risk? Exactly, as yeah. Brent said, because of course uh, the pandemic has been the biggest disruptor in the, the health service arena that I think we've ever seen in anyone's lifetime. Mm. And it's been exceedingly uh, busy, very demanding for health services. They've had to change the way they uh, care for people, change the way they deliver their health services in a very short space of time. And I think boards have been, understandably, very preoccupied with supporting the organisations through those operational challenges. And, and I certainly know from my own experience on the boards that I'm on, but also from the organisations that I'm involved in, everybody is really busy just making the wheels turn. But now that we're starting to come out of that, I think it's really important that as board directors, we look up and around and understand the change that COVID-19 has um, created in our environment and what that means to our strategic intentions. You know, all of us for, for 2020, I had a whole lot of plans this year and none of them have come to fruition. And I'm going to have to really change my plans for next year because it's going to be different. And it's exactly the same yeah at a, an organisation level. All of the things that we had planned to achieve have been disrupted or changed or shifted sideways because of the impact of COVID. And I think it's really important that board directors have those conversations about their strategy. You know, is it still relevant given the substantial change that we've experienced? Is it still relevant? If it is, what needs to be adapted to cope in this new world that we're living in? COVID is not going away. It is going to be here for all time to come. Yes, we'll get it under control with a vaccine, but that's not going to happen overnight. So what does that mean to our strategic intent and how do we adapt going forward? And I think that's the real challenge for the boards because they've got to balance that sort of keeping things operationally above the surface but also thinking long-term about the strategy. And, and particularly in, in these times, the executive and the CEO are so busy just keeping the wheels turning and the lights on, they don't have time to be thinking about that strategy. That's really the board's role. And they need to make sure that they've got the time, the headspace, and they're looking around and understanding the impact of this disruptive change on their world to think about how that needs to move in their strategy. That's really true. and. Tracy, from your perspective with all of the independent schools you're working with, what's happening with strategy there that, that's helpful for us to know about this year? Look, I, I, I think a, a little bit from Brendan and a little bit from Joanne. <laughs> the, the interesting thing about particularly independent schools is historically strategic direction has been a, a sort of combination of, well, we have to do it for compliance to maintain our, our registration or we have a program of transitioning to the IB, of growing our school population, or, or of a building program. And strategic direction has always been linked with an activity. And I think one of the real lessons out of COVID is very few schools were sitting back and saying, what are the trends in education? What's changing? What's different? And how do we position ourselves to capture that broader environment? And it's funny, one of the big impacts of COVID on schools was this transition to online environments. And all of a sudden, you're starting to see the, the high performing boards ask the question around, well, what does that mean? It's no replacement for face to face. But going forward, when can we use that? Obviously, mm. the you know, technology is a big disruption in terms of the massive growth in online assessments, for instance, and online academic competitions. You know, how are we positioned to do that? So I think 
it, it will be very interesting for schools emerging out of COVID not to focus on what was the lesson we learned about a pandemic and around a responding to a health crisis. But what did we learn about ourselves and what did we learn about the opportunities and how can we embed them going forward? That's really good. So it looks to me like COVID actually has brought some opportunities with it and it sounds like it's the job of the boards now to really think about what those opportunities are. That's really interesting. The next area that um, I wanted to ask you all about that is a risk that's identified as well is the notion of ongoing or continuous review and development. And what we mean by that is it's actually about the ongoing review and development of the boards and the directors themselves. And Leon, I'm really interested in hearing the Governance Institute's perspective on this and given all the work that you do, why do you think that this is one of the top areas in 2020 that's come up as a risk? Thank you, Fia. I'll continue on some of the themes that our fellow panellists have touched on. And why it's an ongoing risk is that the current environment or what we've experienced since March has thrown up a, a different way of thinking or a different way of, of needing to operate. And we've spoken about the fact that boards have been spending quite a lot of time in the management of the business. And I think looking at where Governance Institute sees value from a, a whole of organisation perspective is really coming back to the fundamentals and starting off with having a, a really close and deep look at what the purpose is of the entity. What's their cause? What's their meaning? Uh, and why do they exist? And I think bringing that to the fore uh, right now is really helpful in getting alignment, particularly at the board, to understand what is it that they're looking to achieve. And if you're able to get that commonality or common view, uh, you can start then looking at other aspects to your whole of entity governance arrangements. Uh, so let's say you've had that discussion around purpose and meaning. Uh, then from there, you can start looking at, okay, well, what are some of the values within this organisation and have we got the right set of values or do we need to revisit those? And that can really help in ensuring that you've got strong relationships, both with your executive and the board. Once that piece has been undertaken and you're feeling comfortable with that, you can move on to things like um, your strategic initiatives and your objectives and then start looking into some of the core areas of work that need to be pursued. In line with that is having a look at your operating environment and do you have the, the sound structure to allow those employees and those that are charged with those responsibilities to succeed. And then from there, you, you start getting into that next layer of oversight. And that's looking at things like performance indicators, accountabilities, risk and assurance. And are you getting that comfort that you've got all of those um, ducks lined up in a row in the work that's being done, contributing to your strategic initiatives uh, with the right value set. And that's really then driving you towards obtaining your objective. Uh, and I'd recommend that that's a continual review. And from our perspective, boards that spend time going through each of those elements on a regular basis are the ones that are performing well uh, and have held up well in the last 12 months. That's fantastic. Actually, I remember in our last global financial crisis, it was the boards that focused on their values and purpose and stayed true that came out the other side. So I guess yeah. that that's a very good message to, for us to remember. Thanks, Leon. I really like that. Joanne, in your work, which is all about continuous review and development, what have you identified, which is on the board you're on and also with all the work you do? Uh, look, I'm in furious agreement with what <laughs> Leon has said. He's yeah. uh, summed up beautifully how boards should be looking at their own performance and 
and making sure that they're really thinking about how they're performing as a board. So I'll take all of those things as read and <laughs> I might focus on individual directors because I think that's also very important. And I think we do, often boards do spend a lot of time reflecting on their performance as a collective, but it's really important that individual directors reflect on their own performance, particularly in the boardroom. So I would encourage all directors to go and have a conversation with the chair. Say, how do you think I'm doing? Are you happy that I'm contributing the way I should be? Where do you see my strengths as lying around the board that I should try and, you know, leverage from? Where do you think I might need to improve? Are there some things that you think that I could sharpen up a little bit? Have those kinds of conversations. And most chairs would be delighted to have that conversation with the board director because it shows that the board director is really keen, interested and wanting to improve their performance. I think it's also important for board directors to have a look at the, the organisation that they're on the board of and really think about what kind of knowledge and um, skill they need to build in order to be an effective board director for that particular uh, organisation and that particular industry. Uh, so, for example, in health, where my playground is, recent times clinical governance has really come up as being a significant responsibility and accountability for all board directors. But not all board directors on a health service board are clinicians. So it's really important that those non-clinical directors take the time to understand what clinical governance is, have a conversation with the quality director of the organisation that they're on, talk to some of the clinicians, maybe seek some professional uh, development opportunities on clinical governance because mm -hmm. to sharpen up those skills because the board is ultimately responsible for the quality and safety of the care they provide. No board member can absolve themselves of that responsibility. So it's incumbent on that director to make the effort to really understand those clinical governance responsibilities. I also think it's really important that directors get out a bit, have conversations <laughs> with other board directors from the neighbouring health service, network a little bit, have some conversations, be aware of what's going on. The VHA has a whole range of webinars on our website that sort of talk about contemporary health issues. There's opportunities to attend board director forums, both virtually and in person when we're allowed to do that again. Network, make some connections. You'll be amazed at what kind of information you can glean and draw from those conversations that will really lift your performance as an individual director. And I think that's critical to the functioning of a good board for all board directors to be focusing on improving their own skills as well. That's really true. And actually, Joanne, I do, I agree with you. Boards are very focused on the whole board, but actually it's each individual that makes up that overall board um, culture, isn't it? Absolutely. Really important. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and I think yeah. if they've spent that time, they actually feel better about themselves at the board yeah. table. You know, I've spoken to a lot of directors who say, you know, I feel like I'm struggling a bit or I feel a bit uncomfortable. I don't feel like I'm adding value. Once they start to work on their own skills a little bit, they really gain a lot of confidence. They really feel better. They're comfortable about contributing at the board table and they enjoy it so much more. Yeah, no, absolutely true. And Brendan, in aged care, with all the boards and the directors you've been working with, what's your sense of the area of continuous review and development? How's that going in aged care? Well, again, echoing Leon and Joanne's mm -hmm. comments, what, particularly Joanne on the, the drift that we're seeing, mm -hmm. sort of health, we're there now in aged care. The focus on technical governance, particularly, has been brought out through the hearings of the Royal Commission and also in the new standards that we have. And that's a real um, challenge because there is an expectation that directors at least have some ability to engage with the content that's coming to them around clinical governance. Can they interpret the information? Can they make sense of it? Can they then make a decision off the back of that information that is then cascaded throughout the organisation? So that's a bit of a challenge. And particularly when you have primarily not-for-profits operating within aged care, you often have community-based boards or multicultural, Aboriginal specific organisations. Sometimes a specific community might be served by an organisation. So drawing the director talent from that, that particular population, 
that has all of those skill sets that you need is quite challenging at times for those organisations. And just a quick rattle through of some of the professions that we've encountered that are directors on aged care organisations. You're looking at people who run the local lawnmower shop, music repair shop, the the butcher. Yeah, it, it, they're not professions where you would think mm, clinical governance. Yes, you could identify the top five risks when the regulator comes and does their audit and you're put on the spot around your directorship and oversight responsibilities of that organisation. So I think the other thing, just to pick up on the, the review side of things, aged care has had a culture within its management of continuous review and development. And that's the DNA of how we operate. There's a a CI plans is an acronym that you use quite often, continuous improvement plans. That's an expectation. You should have that. But boards have often said, well, that's that's management. Yeah, that's what we expect you to have. But it's not being felt at their level. So pleasingly, we are starting to see a lot more organisations engage with the need to improve as a board because of the multitude of issues that they are grappling with and part of that is developing existing directors but also some of the stuff we've been talking about already around community engagement stakeholders media management we haven't covered technology but those kind of issues new areas for our industry that they're saying we need some director talent in those areas really that's very true and tracy does the similar things apply in the independent schools for your experience yeah, yes and no. I think it's interesting to bring that independent school lens on it for a moment. Yeah, a bit different, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. And That's just good. like aged care, you've always had management that are very focused on as individuals and as teams. How do we continuously improve? How do we measure ourselves? How are we accountable to our communities, to our regulators? But not so much at a board level. And I guess the difference you've got in the independent sector is the board directors are volunteers. And it is actually, it's against the law to pay people to be on an independent school board. And as such, you tend to draw people who view it as a community, a contribution to the community, more so than serving as a director. And I think that brings with it, it shouldn't, but it brings with it a different approach around continuous improvement, that you, you have people that say, well, I've got my day job, I'm looking after my family, this is my kid's school, I'm going to contribute by being on the board you want me to do some training, you want me to do extra reading, you want me to do this, well, I don't have time for this now. And so it's it's actually been a real challenge on independent boards to actually get that engagement from some of the directors in order to have continuous improvement. And a couple of the states have recognised that and they've actually brought in a, a certain block of mandatory training for directors of independent school boards, recognising that in order to be eligible, you need to do, and it's not a lot, it's six or seven hours a a year, but it is enough to actually start the process and start asking your questions and shift that attitude from a community contribution to a professional board member. That's really interesting. Actually, Tracy, on the back of that, Brendan, the commission, one of the findings might be similar, that there'll be a way of noting directors' training and keeping track of people's actual status in that area. Yeah, it's certainly something we've been looking at with great interest and certainly casting an eye across the fence at what the independent schools have been doing and the model that they have, certainly in New South Wales, where I'm based, and just looking at what that might look like if we transpose that into the aged care uh, industry. And I, I would certainly anticipate that that's probably quite an easy lever to pull for the government um, to have sort of, if you like, professionalisation of directors within aged care. So if you looking into your crystal ball for the report, I would suggest that that's possibly one that will be in there. Mm. Hey, could I, yes, could I add a, yes. a comment? Um, yeah. I, I think now's the appropriate time to also comment on the fact that boards should be having a look at their own performance and looking at an evaluation of their performance from an external party, whether that be through a a survey. I need to to comment on that, but also um, have that independent review. Quite often boards Mm. um, can take the view that they're doing a great job if you ask the individuals 
on the board. That's why Governance Institute would be a strong advocate for having a regular independent review um, mm. to get that assurance that what is actually taking place is um, meeting the requirements or the expectations of our um, shareholders and stakeholders. Mm. It's a very good point. And look, just to finish really quickly, there's a fantastic comment by one of our guests today about the notion of why should directors be kept in the dark about learnings from other sectors? In other words, Joanne and Brendan and Tracy, on the back of your fantastic comments about knowing sector-specific information that directors have to, like clinical governance, it, it, wouldn't it be important that somehow we could help all directors learn that you have to know the risks of your sector which is probably the perfect segue to the next area and we could probably bring that subject up into our next area of questioning which is around risk management that this is the big all-time kahuna everybody and I think it'd be great and we won't lose sight of that very important question but let's talk to Leon because you've actually done a risk management survey at the Governance Institute haven't you and so could you just sort of talk to us a little bit about that and help us understand risk a little bit better and then we'll hear from everybody else about the other sectors as well. Yes so earlier this year just as and the pandemic was emerging. The Governance Institute undertook a survey with over 400 governance and risk professionals, mainly senior executives, those who are responsible for the implementation of the risk management frameworks and registers. And it was quite fascinating to see some of the observations of the data and the results. And I'm really excited to share some of those findings because I would suggest that these are all things that boards should be taking a closer look at and reviewing on a regular basis. So one of the first things that struck me and, and some of my peers here at Governance Institute is that nearly 40% of businesses were not regularly testing their risk and crisis plans. So that's just to unpack that a little bit. And that's not to say that our businesses didn't have a crisis plan. It's the fact that it was never tested and never tried in a, a real world type of scenario. And so lots of people made the comment that they were having to dust them off out of the top drawer as things were starting to play out back in March. And so uh, I would suggest that if organisations haven't done something like that uh, this year, then it's time to, to reconsider and have a really close look at that in terms of what the environment has in front of us over the next 12 months. And um, Another interesting stat, and this gets to what are the most immediate and serious risks that organisations should be uh, considering. And the top risk is actually brand and reputation. Now, obviously, that is not a, a risk that you should look at in isolation. It goes to some of the other operations of your business and how if a key service or product was to create a situation where individuals felt aggrieved or um, felt as if they didn't receive what they had expected. That's the connection through to brand and, and reputation, but that was at 60%. So extraordinary number there. The other risk that was deemed immediate and serious was the uh, prospect of policy change or legal uh, intervention from government. And, and that was sitting at 59 percent so from our perspective i think that's a really initial view of what are the top line aspects that we wanted to share with the broader business community uh, and obviously there's further information available in the report if people are interested but i think that's a, a really good starting point for our panelists to to comment on really interesting and and tracy i was thinking what a coincidence because uh, when you look at the top risks Aon, for example, survey, it's no coincidence that in independent schools that reputation and a huge risk. So Tracy, from your perspective, what have you been seeing about that? Look, it's it's no surprise, let me say. <laughs> my, my background is working in across a range of regulated sectors and particularly board and management level. And to 
all, all of these comments are comments you hear from every single sector and from every single thinking board that it's complicated and it's difficult and then you have the detail overlay. It is a hard juggling act to do, but some do it better than others. And those who don't try usually don't succeed like anything else. Brendan, for you, it's exactly the same thing in aged care. You often tell me that it's that reputation because they're not just care centres, they're actually businesses as well. So yeah, and huge, and reputation, huge risks. It is and it isn't kind of thing. It's, a, it's an interesting one with reputation because it, it's certainly in the training that I've been running with directors and management around governance in aged care, a course that we co-deliver with the Governance Institute, that is the number one item that directors say, not necessarily management, but certainly directors' reputation because it speaks to the sustainability of the company and its ongoing livelihood, shall we say. But then at the same time, when you think about aged care, it is generally a needs-based purchase once only. So reputation is not necessarily harmed too badly, I would say. I'm not trying to be an apologist or anything, but the, the effect of a name is not as great as perhaps in some other industries where there's a, a purchasing arrangement that is ongoing, frequent, and is a want-based purchase. So if you think about if, if you have a country town and there's one provider in that town and they have something bad go wrong in their facility, it's not easy for a consumer to say, well, I won't make the purchase from that provider because that's the only option for them. So there is a little bit of insulation, shall we say, from reputation damage, but it is still very much a concern for directors within the industry. So they are conscious of it and they're very focused on it from a risk management perspective. And if you can quote a CEO from another industry at another Royal Commission, the National Australia Bank CEO said reputation was like a tortoise to arrive and a hare to depart. So... It is that sort of slow grinding shoulder to the wheel kind of model. Uh, but then once it goes, it is in free fall and it is really hard yes. to work with and exactly. get back. So it, it is certainly something on people's uh, radar. That's why it's in your top five. In terms of what we might see in the future, Tracy's just mentioned it as well. We're, the Council Assisting's recommendations spoke to attestations by directors about performance. So there's a personal shift now. The directors have to sign that off. That performance has been achieved. So it's getting a bit more personal there. And so again, watch that space for directors around what might come out in the final report and then any sort of government response. But in terms of the risk management and the compliance stuff, that's generally the fairly easy lever for government to pull when they're responding to these sort of commissions and inquiries. So watch for more in that space, I would suggest, around risk management um, and compliance. So I guess, Joanne, that's a perfect segue to you because where is it sitting in health around why is risk yet again right up there with the top risks, which sounds stupid, doesn't it? But it is. <laughs> uh, look, I think boards are a bit nervous about risk and I think mm. board directors in particular struggle to really understand it. In my experience, a lot of the boards that I've spoken to, they see it as a process and, you know, if we've got our risk register looking right now, traffic light system and we review our policy and framework every 12 months, that's risk. Risk isn't that to me. Risk is an attitude. Risk is a way of thinking. Risk is a way of looking at everything that comes before you in the board and thinking about what are the risks associated with this? How do we manage the risks? What do I need to be aware of? How do I make sure I'm stopping the bad things from happening? It needs to be a constant line of inquiry and a line of thought. And, and to my view, it's a risk management um, approach at a board level is not having a good risk management framework, a system or a risk register. It's around having regular conversations. What does this mean to us from a risk perspective? How do we manage this? And I think that's that's really important. And if I may, I'd like to respond to the question. Yes, that I was going to see if you would like to do that. 
<laughs> because I absolutely agree with, I think it's Armon, it's mm. absolutely critical that we look at what's happening in other industries. And the Banking Royal Commission is a classic. And if you look at the key things that were highlighted there, it was around leadership and culture. And when we had the, the clinical governance crisis here in Victoria, what came out of it was leadership and culture. So we need to be looking at other industries to understand some of the lessons that we can learn and carry across. And Commissioner Hay made a wonderful uh, set of, I think it was six or seven recommendations, you know, basic principles that the banking sector should follow. And those are basic principles that I think any sector should follow. They're basic common sense. I actually wrote a short paper to translate some of the learnings from the, bank, the Banking Royal Commission to the health sector. And pretty much everything that came out of it applies. So we should be looking broadly to understand what else is happening in governance outside of our own industries and how do we translate that to our own environment. But as I said, risk management is not so much a thing or a structure, it's an attitude. And boards need to develop that risk attitude where they have the conversation all the time. Mm. No, I 100% agree. And I agree, it was a very good point to make. And I think all of us need to be more proactive in sharing and sort of contextualising those great learnings. Every time I read something from a Royal Commission, it is a great learning. Mm. And it always comes back to the individual. You can't blame the whole board. Each of you as individuals make up the whole board. And that actually is the perfect segue to the final top risk. And this risk has um, not been in our top risks before. And I think that's because it's on the back of we now don't just work with review and development of whole boards. It's actually individual directors as well. And the top risk that's come out of all of that work over the last three years is actually the directors not having skills of the sector or the industry they're in. So they might have high professional skills and background, they might have a high understanding of corporate um, governance, but it's been identified that there is an enormous gap when asked around their actual skills or knowledge of the sector they're in. And continually, when we talk to directors about this, they say, but we're not meant to have those skills. I guess what the point is in this particular area is it's about understanding the top risks in your particular area and having knowledge of those. And I'd love to start with you, Joanne, because you're doing such a lot of work with not just whole boards, but individuals as well. So shine some light on this for us from your perspective. For me, there's two parts to this area. Today. So I'll talk first of all about the sector relevant skills. Yep. One of the things that came out of the targeting zero review into the health sector after the clinical governance failings that we had at Jerry Warra was that there were no clinicians on the board. So there was nobody who really understood mm. the business. So it was very easy for information to be passed through the board and not have the right questions asked, not have the level of interrogation or challenge to the information that was provided. And if questions were asked, often the understanding of the answer that was provided wasn't high level enough to really know whether you had your question answered or not. And it was recognised out of their, that review that all health service boards should have a registered clinician on the board. So you've got someone there who actually understands clinical language. And I'm the first person to own up. I've worked in health my entire life. And in health, we love an acronym. I call it the TLA syndrome, the three-letter acronym syndrome. And unless you speak that acronym language, it is really hard to get to the bottom of the information that you're being presented with. So it's critical to have somebody there who understands the business. But that doesn't absolve other board members from making efforts to understand the business as well. Just because you're, as I said earlier, not a clinician on the board, that doesn't mean that you aren't also accountable for the quality and safety of the healthcare that's provided. So it's really important that other members of the board 
develop relevant sector skills, that they get to know the business, they understand how it works, they understand what the key risks are in that particular industry, they understand the drivers and the levers for that business so that they can also interrogate, ask the right questions, challenge information, seek further information on issues of concern. So whilst it's really important to have somebody on the board that does have very specific industry skills, relevant sector skills, I think it's also imperative that other board directors develop their own knowledge and understanding of the sector as well, so that they can use their other skills, whether they're an accountant, lawyer, somebody with HR, whatever, they can use those skills appropriately within that particular segment of the sector. Mm. I think that's really important. Thanks, Joanne. And Tracy, I'm interested in independent schools. The, does this apply as well? Is this your discovery as well? Yes, to some extent. I think mm. schools really benefit from a, a diverse range of skills in, and particularly that came out as we were watching schools through COVID to have somebody sitting on a board and saying, well, look, I work at a multinational and over there in whatever country, our people are not traveling anymore. Well, I work in um, HR and this is what we're finding. And so because schools are particularly the large schools, really, really complicated enterprises having that perspective from a number of different sectors and a number of different levels within those sectors has actually been a real benefit to schools. I think where the challenge is, is that you're right, Joanne's absolutely right, that sometimes the right questions are not asked or the right answer is not given and nobody knows the right answer is not given. And I think that is increasingly an issue, particularly if you've got a very dominant principal, because remember in schools, there is a real distinction between the governance and the management. And the management has many TLAs and the management has a jargon and a focus all of its own. So not having anybody on the board to understand that can actually be a challenge. And I suspect a, a really important challenge going forward that has to be grappled with, because how do you look at the impact of technology on education if you only understand half the question? Mm. And, and I think that's going to be the real challenge for boards going forward. I agree. And Brendan, from an aged care perspective, is, is this a big yeah, issue as well? Yeah, echo what Joanne's been saying, particularly mm. around, as I was saying before, this drift into aged care with the Royal Commission very much saying core business for you is looking after the clinical deterioration of older people who are frail with multiple complex conditions. So you've got to have some level of insight and understanding mm you know, clinical governance and the information that is being presented to you. Even if you are in those professions I was rattling off before and you can add plumbers and grain silo operators that we've come across as well. You've got to have some ability to ask the right kind of questions. And when Joanne was talking, I couldn't help but mentally drift off to that famous episode, uh, first episode of Yes Minister, where uh, the minister arrives. <laughs> and, uh, he says he recalls Sir Humphrey from a previous ep estimates hearing, and thank you for answering all of his questions. And Sir Humphrey says, well, I'm glad you thought so, Minister. Because it, the questions actually do need to be answered, not in a Sir Humphrey way. That doesn't help good governance if you are not answering the questions from a management perspective. But you've also got to have good questions to be asked of management. And that's one of the things I've been focusing on in the training that I've been delivering is uh, equipping directors to be able to ask better questions, to cut through the uh, TLAs and also hold management to account for what they are producing as management and ensuring that things are done in the manner in which you expect them to be done. The other thing I'd just sort of like to add, I suppose, is that it, it, it can be a little bit confronting sometimes for CEOs to have someone with a bit of inside information. And so that's a little bit of a difficult one for management when they're often charged with, can you find us a new director? And it's put on the management to go and find uh, people for the nominations committee. So that can be difficult, but I think as a CEO, you should be courageous enough. There's another Sir Humphrey expression, but courageous enough to have an insider that will actually support what you're trying to do. Because what we see in aged care also is sometimes boards just don't know. And so the CEO is actually sort of hitting those roadblocks on the board because they just don't know what decision to make with the information being presented to them because they lack the insight from a sector um, specific knowledge base. I suppose just a, a positive to end on is just the number of laser staff, my colleagues who are directors, 
not always of aged care organisations, but we are starting to be approached by aged care organisations. Can you please be on our board? Because they know they don't have this sector insight and we're kind of independent, but we'll certainly act in their best interest, both from an association perspective, but also as a director on the board. That's really good. I know that does work for, with you too, Joanne, which is terrific. It's a positive conflict. <laughs> Leon, what about yeah. you? Really brief comment. If I was on a board and, and someone asked me about getting sector relevant skills, I'd probably refer the individual asking the question to Section 9 of the Corporations Act, where it <laughs> refers to duty of care and diligence. Uh, and that's where it's reasonable to expect a director to have an understanding uh, of their obligations for the entity that they're responsible for. So if they're on a board of an aged care facility, even if they are a musical repair person, I think it'd be reasonable to expect that they understood the sector that they operated within. So I think that's probably all I've got to say on, on that one. Um, that's actually. really helpful, Leon. I think everyone's going to be looking that up right now. In fact, I just wrote that down. So thank you so much for all your insights. Let's finish with a tip from each of you because uh, this has been the most wonderful conversation today. Brendan. Lucky me, I get to go first. So points that Glenn, who I know well, put in the chat box before was uh, that was answered previously was about the, the consumers on the board. And my answer to that, which I didn't give at the time, was no, and to Leon's just <laughs> well-made point there. But it, it, notwithstanding that, absolutely boards in aged care should be really ensuring that they are grappling, engaging with, and responding to consumers in, in at the board level, whether it's data, stories, personal experience, experiences, walking the floor, whatever it may be, make sure you're engaging with your consumers. And that will help with a lot of the five risks. The second um, key point I would just like to make in conclusion is around risk management. And that is that what we see too often is an emphasis on risk from a negative perspective. So to the points around strategy as well is to see risk in an opportunity side of things, a positive. It is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So that can be a positive, particularly in aged care at the moment, try to find the positives in your risk efforts. Thank you, Brendan. And thank you so much for your contribution today. Joanne, have you got a tip for us? Look, this must be because I was a speech pathologist in a previous life, but <laughs> I think that boards need to have conversations. I get very concerned. And one of the things that worries me about our virtual board environment at the moment is boards aren't having conversations with each other. It's really important that get your agenda over and done with, work on all your business, but then have a conversation and get to know each other. Know and understand the skills that you've got around you at the board table so that you can tap into them effectively. Develop relationships, develop that sense of team because that is how a board is going to function really well. And I think that's important. A board should be a team and a team can't work as a team if they never spend any time getting to know each other. The other thing I would, I would just like to mention is the skills. We talked about making sure you've got sector skills on the board. I think it's also really important to have a look at your strategic plan and see what kind of skills you need to help deliver on that strategic plan. So if you've got a major capital building project on your strategic plan, get somebody who understands project management or asset management or something like that. If you're looking at expanding in, in technology, get somebody with IT skills on the board. Think about the people that you need around you at a board level that are going to contribute the skills and the expertise that will help you get where you want to go. That's really important. Wonderful. Thank you. Tracy? I, I think um, a bit like the others, my, my kind of final word is based on sort of decades of experience looking at how do you manage reputation in a regulated sector and across all sectors. And I think the one take I would have from pretty much every regulated sector we've worked in is that boards don't look around enough. And boards think that they can set a strategy, they can assess risks and determine what their risk appetite is without knowing what is the policy environment? Where are the political imperatives for change or for improvement or for winding back what has happened recently? How might you change that? Where are the upcoming disruptors? And how are you preparing for that? And how are you steering into what you can't avoid and making sure you're well positioned? And, and I guess the other is values. 
and I, I see organisations and boards say, here are our seven values, and they never change. Yet community expectations change and public expectations of what is good governance changes. And yet none of these organisations update those and they're just the seven words that appear. <laughs> and yet they go off and they do things that come out in royal commissions and all sorts of things that don't really yeah. add up to the list. But it's because they're so internally focused. They're not looking at the environment that is changing and developing around them. And I think that is a, a risk if we want to use that word, but I think it is a real lost opportunity. And it does capture a number of the things that we've been um, we've been talking about today. You're not in a vacuum and governance is not static. Mm, really true. Thank you. And Leon. What's your tip for us today? Yeah, my tip would be to ask, have we got the right business model in place at the moment? And have we inadvertently ended up in an approach that has a heavy reliance on something which we may not have control over? And so I'd get people to have a think about that risk management approach and crisis management, for example, a reliance on the internet connection or electricity, because I think that's our oxygen for a lot of organisations <laughs> at the moment. So what's plan B? And spend enough time looking at the, the low likelihood, high consequence risks in your register, because that's exactly where COVID would be. Terrific. Thank you. And look, I cannot thank you enough today. And last but not least, just in serious gratitude and thank you to Brendan Moore, Joanne Morfoot, Tracy Kane, and Leon Cox. Your insights and discussion today was really interesting. In fact, I became so interested, sometimes I almost forget to ask the next person. It was just absolutely wonderful. It's been a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much. 